Peter. Welcome to the Demon Land podcast. Thanks for your time. Uh, congratulations on the retirement. You said at the BNF that a, a good CEO knows the right time to hand over the reins. Um, why are you pulling up stumps now? And how tempting was it to stay on a little bit longer, given that we're so close to going all the way? Oh, look, I, I think I'm sure it was the right time. Uh, no doubt about that. I mean, I'm uh, people don't believe how old I am, which I'm privileged to say, but uh, I'm, I'm 66 next February, and I think you've got to be, you know, young for this game, younger for this game. And uh, I think it's uh, important to know when when the right time is, when to hand over. It, football's not a a job as such, it's a way of life, and it's uh, sort of seven days. It takes, it defines everything of who you are. So you, you've got to be, you've got to know you can do it all that time. Uh, so I think that's the first step. Um, the second step is waiting for a premiership. I mean, the, these things aren't easy. This game's a really tough game, and you've seen, you know, we really hope that the team will go on next year. But uh, whether they go on and then perform on the day, all sorts of things can happen. You can't hang around making decisions about leadership based on hoping to hold up a premiership cup. I mean, you get just as much uh, uh, enjoyment and satisfaction sitting in the grandstand watching them win it as uh, actually standing there holding it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty clear about that. Fair enough. Uh, Peter, you came to the club at its lowest ebb at a time when the likes of Jeff Kennett were calling for us to be relocated to Tassie. Uh, what would have happened if this latest rebuild had failed? And was there an existential threat to the club at the time? Uh, yeah, look, I, I think it was fair to say the club was at a very low ebb. I was, I didn't, I wasn't there for very long before I worked out that I didn't think it was, you know, a, a real threat. I thought it just needed some straightening up into some certain positions. I mean, one of the most important thing I noticed when I got there, and I've said this publicly on a few occasions, you know, you, you walk into an organisation, you want you want your people to be your very best. And if you looked around the organisation, we didn't have uh, key people in, in in key roles that had success around an AFL environment and knew what a success was. So we had to had to bring people in. And the, the thing about bringing in a guy like Paul Ruse, he was never going to make the, the difference on the field in the time frame that he was going to be there. But what he did was he offered a lot of uh, stability and time and hope, you know, supporters like yourselves, if Paul Ruse is there and you believe he's trying, he's doing his best, his reputation is such that you know he's going to um, do all the right things. And if, if, it, if the thing takes longer to to work with someone like Paul there, then you, you then you start to understand that, uh, well, you know, this is a bit of a rebuild that's got to happen. It's not something that can be fixed overnight. And then what also happens is you get people like that, then others get attracted to your club. So you gradually build up the numbers of very good people who know what AFL football is all about. And, and if you look through the football department, the football club now, you can see the place is full of those sort of people. And I think that's the most important thing. And I think behind all of that as well, you could see that there was a commercial opportunity. You just weren't getting the best out of the out of the numbers. Uh, people had, had deserted the club, which is fair enough under the circumstances of poor performance. So we got the footy team back playing, and uh, we did made some decent commercial decisions. I never thought the club was was in threat, but I could understand how supporters uh, looking from the outside might have thought that. Uh, Peter, we've made steady year-on-year -year progress up the ladder uh, since it took over, but there were plenty of hiccups along the way. Did you ever have real doubts that it might not come together or, or think to yourself, what have I got myself into here? Because some of those no, never. No, I can honestly, I can honestly say never. And I, and I think that I, I talked to someone on media last week and uh, yeah, I think people need to understand what's involved in, in getting a club and I know Melbourne supporters are frustrated because, you know, there was rebuild and then there was a rebuild and then there was a rebuild. So I get that part of it, but I can only talk about the rebuild that I was involved with. I can't talk about others. But I, I was talking to someone on the media last week and, and you know, talk, AFL talking about giving priority picks to some clubs that aren't performing now, to my mind, is just a Band-Aid solution. It doesn't solve anything in the, in the longer term. Um, the, the, these things take a minimum of five years to turn around because you've got to, as I just said, you've got to get the right people into the club and then they've got to build the right list and then you've got to develop. And that list is going to come in the main from the draft, not from senior established players. So then you've got to develop those kids. First of all, you've got to get the right ones, then you've got to develop them. And so 
I think it's absolutely extraordinary uh, what the club's achieved in, in a five-year period in terms of putting the list together and then developing them, which I did say at the best and fairest. And um, But people have to understand clubs take that long. There's no short-term solutions. There's no silver bullets or whatever other cliche you want to use. It's a long haul. And, and you, you look to the long term, you don't get worried about the hiccups as you describe them because that, that happens in footy. When you've been around footy as this long, you, you know that hiccups are on the way and uh, they happen all the time, but it's it's the long term you've got to keep your, your focus on. And I've never had any doubt about that. Uh, Paul Ruse was a crucial piece of the puzzle on the road back to respectability. Uh, at the time you persuaded him to sign on, he was adamant that he wouldn't coach again. Uh, who else was on the short list and how important was Ruse's um, imprimatur in terms of giving the team and the club the breathing space to get it right uh, because a less senior coach wouldn't have been given the same latitude by the media. No, that's exactly right. I think what Paul did was in, it was bought some time. I mean, he came in when, when we'd won two games and his first year we'd won four. If you think about, for, for example, having put Simon Goodwin in then and we won four games, everybody would be, well, what's going on here? You know, mm. Because people didn't understand, quite understand how the depth of the challenge it was facing with a, with a player rebuild. So, you know, if Paul, with his uh, reputation in Pramada, sort of gets that, people go, well, yeah, we've got a bit of a problem here. We're going to have to wait and be patient. So he was really critical for that. Um, and as I said before, he, he, in, he gave other people the faith to come in to the club, like Simon Goodwin himself uh, and other assistant coaches that he brought in and are still there now, Benny Matthews, for example, and then Brendan McCartney came in later. So those people think, well, the club's on the right way, heading the right way. I can come into this club with confidence, whereas they may not have done that, you know, 2012, 2013. So Paul was was critical in that regard, absolutely. Well, was there a plan B if we couldn't secure Rusey? Oh, well, we, were, we, we had started a process and we're interviewing others, but we we're always looking at a a more senior coach for those same reasons. Uh, but some, you know, coaches, some senior coaches want to coach forever. That's what they're passionate about. So to talk to other senior coaches about coming in with a, you know, a, a plan that involved handing it over was not, not always well received by seeing other, other guys looking at the role. But it never really came to the fact that we, we looked at plan B, by the way, because we, we had started a process. We ran a couple of interviews. But then Rusey decided he would get involved, so the the, plant, the process really never took place. Uh, Pete, he did, did a remarkable job of completely changing the entire culture of the club. Um, you spoke before about bringing in Rusey and bringing in the right people. What were some of the other things that you immediately identified uh, that needed changing when you arrived at, uh, at Melbourne? Well, yeah, I, I think uh, I've sort of touched on it already. The most important thing was to build the right people there. And, and I mean, if I look for people to come in, come into any organisation, I mean, it's basically intelligence and character. If you've, if you've got those to start with, the intelligence to do the job and the character, you know, the resilience and the ethics, the standards to, to do the job and operate the way you want people to operate, then you, you're off to a great start. So... We, that was that was one of the most important things. If you get those mix of people, you get the, we, we, we talk about weight of numbers. So the reason I went for Paul Roos in the first place is that uh, he had started this process up in Sydney and I think Sydney have had an outstanding performance over the last 20 years in terms of their culture and uh, and what's how that's turned into football performance. So the fact that... Um, you know, Rusey started that process up there. Well, he was going to help start this process up down here as well. So then if you build weight of numbers around him, around me, and what we believe in and how you should do work, then the culture changes through the through those people, you know, their own standards and behaviours, the way they operate. So you get a weight of numbers, as we like to say, of people who want to operate a certain way, and then that gradually weeds out the wrong people and brings in more of the right people. And so you, you accumulate a group of really good, talented people. And it really just takes off from there, to be quite fair. I mean, that, that sounds very simple, what I just said, but that took three years to get yeah. to that position. Uh, and, you know, you've you got some of the best uh, people in your list management team now who have... I, I think that's one of the outstanding things that needs to be commented on and needs to be understood by Melbourne supporters because 
between, you know, say 2007 and 2013, you had plenty of opportunity to pick talented young players and, and we didn't do it. And uh, when you look at the people like headed up by Josh Marnie and then you put Todd Viney and Jason Taylor and Tim Lamb and Kelly o, O'Donnell in there and all those sort of people who actually know what football's all about and pick kids based on character, competitiveness as well as talent, you end up with a list playing the game the way you guys want it to be played today. So, you know, that it, it all sounds so simple and straightforward and it, it actually is simple and straightforward, <laughs> but it takes a lot of time to put those people together and, and then get those results. Um, take us through your thoughts and emotions watching the elimination final against the Cats. Uh, there's 91,000 at the G, the majority of the Melbourne supporters, the team's playing ferocious finals footy, it was a special night for many reasons. Uh, you must have felt a real sense of accomplishment. Yeah, look, I, I felt, you know, we all felt really good for the fans because you, you've done it so hard for so long. And, uh, you know, Melbourne Football Club, with the history and tradition that it has and, you know, people going back generations uh, looking, watching this this team play and so disappointed in the last number of years. I mean, we, we were, it was as much about the fans as it was about uh, anything we'd done. I mean, because a football club is owned by the fans and, uh, you know, they're the ones that uh, pay our salaries and turn up at the turnstiles and buy memberships and those sorts of things. And without them, we don't, we can't do what we do. So to me, the greatest accomplishment of that night was seeing 90,000 people come into the MCG, two thirds of whom were red and blue. And, um, you know, that also vindicates what I been was banging on about to the board for so long for um, about how you how you solve the, the, the commercial future of this football club and that's build a good football team. Like the old saying, build it and they will come. Yeah. Well, they came and uh, they came again the week after and, and, you know, I'm sure they'll come next year as a result of that. And uh, if they have the faith and the respect of their footy team, they'll keep coming and that's the way you build a commercially strong football club. It's that simple. Um, so really, I, I, I did watch a replay of the game afterwards, by the way, and, um, you know, I was watching the crowd more than I was watching the football because <laughs> I already knew what had happened. And Channel 7 did a fantastic job, I think, in the way they broadcast the crowd as well as the game. And there was that one particular incident after uh, Mitch Hannon ran down the flank and kicked the goal and BT was at his consummate best and... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you've watched all this, but the way the Channel 7 cameras just panned back and picked the north, picked out the northern stand, and sort of that—that's the accomplishment. Seeing that um, that image and those people, and a lot of different faces as well, um, if I can say that. You know, there was we we've been talking for three or four years about introducing new people to Melbourne to the Melbourne Football Club because it's quintessential. Melbourne, it's quintessential Melbourne culture. Um, come down to the Melbourne Football Club, watch the club team play at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And uh, if you look at that crowd and that uh, the Channel 7 cameras, you'll see a lot of diverse people in the audience, in, in the crowd. And I just think that that's fantastic as well. So, you know, things are looking bright for the future in that regard, I hope. Yeah, we sub- we were actually surprised at the um, at the crowd number that night, the strength of the demon numbers, or did you know that there was that dormant? Well, we knew it was coming. We knew on Tuesday it was coming. We sold more Melbourne tickets through, uh, despite the ticket tech debacle, we, <laughs> sold, we sold more Melbourne tickets in, in, in the first uh, 30 minutes than, than Richmond bought, so, wow. which, which was interesting just to see. And uh, so we knew it was coming. Um, but the you know the fanaticism, the, the the excitement, all of that that was that was what uh, we didn't know who they were or where they came from, but uh, we knew they were coming. So it was great. It was fantastic. That and and the week after. It certainly was, uh, Peter. We've seen really solid year on year improvement in memberships. What's the potential for future growth on the back of finals and regular September appearances? What number should we be aiming at? Well, that's a hard one for me to, to 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 work out because I don't actually know how big the Melbourne supporter base is. I mean, it's one it's at the smaller end of the spectrum. There's no doubt about that, and we already have a massive conversion rate. Like, like people have told me, we've got 
200, 250,000 supporters. So if you've got 45,000 members, that's already one of the highest, one of the two highest conversion rates in the competition. Add to that that there's another 10 MC, 10,000 MCC people who are MCC members but are passionate Melbourne supporters who don't don't take up the joint membership. So you're really sitting with 55,000. So it's really hard to know whether there's more people are going to come out. I think, you know, the, the excitement that was built in September, the run home, I think, attracted a hell of a lot of attention. I think there's a lot of people, you know, coming to Mel- coming into Melbourne who might want to pick up Melbourne. Uh, sorry, AFL football in Melbourne. I think they'd naturally pick up Melbourne at the moment because of what happened and the excitement around it. So, look, I, I don't know what the opportunity is. Um, in terms of hard traditional numbers, um, I'm not sure there's there's too much left in terms of conversion, but in terms of new people coming in to the city and coming into AFL ranks, I think that and young kids, younger people coming in, I think that you know there's unlimited opportunity. So, yeah, can we get to sixty thousand? Possibly. I don't know if we'll do it next year, but I think we should get to fifty five. Sorry, two thousand and nineteen, fifty five thousand perhaps. But um, I'm not sure you're ever going to get to the the scale of the Collingwoods and, and uh, Essendon's, but that doesn't matter. What matters is people coming to your games and sitting on seats and watching games. That's where it really matters. Is there any way to convert the, the MCC members? I mean, I'm sure that's a conundrum that's faced the club for years. Um, yeah, but they're very valuable, Pete. They're very valuable to us. Uh, I mean, there's, there's about, in, in round numbers, there's about 20,000 uh, people that uh, in the MCC members who are staunch Melbourne supporters and, and half of those take up a joint MCC MFC membership and I think it's been like that for 10 years and hasn't moved so uh, it suggests the other 10 aren't necessarily going to sign on but they turn up to the football every week and, and if they turn up and come into the MCC we get the benefit of that commercially we we you know, that gets paid into the gate. So they're still re- very, very important to us, those people that turn up, uh, because it's just like anyone turning up and sitting in the Southern Stand. We still get paid for them turning up. So, um, yeah, look, it'd be nice if they if they uh, converted a joint membership, but it's also really nice that they turn up and watch the game every week. Uh, there was a fair bit of media attention surrounding the appointment of your successor, and suggestions in some quarters that people weren't happy with the process around that. Uh, you would know, you would have known Gary Pert for a long time uh, in footy. Is he the right man for the job? Oh, he's an experienced CEO who's been running, uh, you know, a big football club for a number of years, ten years or so. I wasn't involved in that process. The board, the board, um, the board ran that process, and uh, they ran an exhaustive process, and they made the pick as as the boards do. That's what they're there for. Yeah. And uh, I'd be confident that they ran that process properly, and uh, they've made a decision that they think's the right decision, which is fine. So it's not it's not up to me to judge, um, you know, make any opinion or, or commentary about that, that sort of thing. I don't think that would be fair or reasonable. So um, the board made that it, that process. It's their responsibility and their obligation to do that, and they've made the call that they think's right. Fair and, I, and I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure he's. If you look at his experience and his history of, with Collingwood, he's, he's done a very good job over most of that time. So I'm, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure the football club will be good, in good hands. Uh, what can you tell us about the proposed new training and admin base in Yarra Park? Uh, and what are the chances of having it approved by the relevant authorities? Uh, well, it's an opportunity that was brought to us by others. It's the, the, the building itself sits over the top of the railway tracks as a concept, so it don't, there's no... There's no building as such within uh, Yarra Park at all. Um, it's all. All the building is on uh, is outside of Yarra Park. Uh, it looks like a fantastic opportunity for the club. It looks like an opportunity that could set up uh, the club for the next 50 years, depending on the commercial terms which the club could secure that site. Um, and that's really, really important because to be a successful footy team on the field, you need a very strong commercial foundation to keep the club sound. And you guys who've been following this club for a number of years would know that we've 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 had those problems because we've been, um, you know, wandering around looking for sort of different types of facilities. Never had a, a constant home, and never had um, 
you know, a strong commercial base for a facility. So it could potentially set up the football club for the next 50 years, which means your children and grandchildren could continue to watch the footy club. And I think that's really, really important. And the only thing that's in Yarra Park itself is, is, is an oval. So, I mean, when people sit down and think about that, there's already a couple of ovals in Yarra Park now. One's called the MCG and the other one's called Punt Road. But, you know, to actually level out a bit of the area up there, which is not the best area now as it is, and upgrade it and to just have it used for sort of six to ten hours to, to have footballers train on it and the rest of the time it's still open to the public is not a huge impediment. There's plenty of precedents both in Melbourne and around the world for this sort of thing. Um, you know, Faulkner Park's got playing fields in it that get, get used from time to time and some of the great cities of the world have sporting facilities in, within their parklands within the middle of their cities. So it's and, and that whole area is surrounded by massive amounts of parkland. So really, well, I don't think we're asking too much in terms of the oval and, and we'd probably even upgrade. You know, people would see that the, the Yarra Park itself was upgraded um, and uh, there'd be community uh, benefits attached to all of that and improvements done to all of that. But all the building is is off Yarra Park. It's over the railway tracks. So I, I don't think it's a. I think if anything, we could we could realistically argue uh, with our hand on our heart that we'd actually improve a part of Yarra Park rather than rather than actually uh, the track from it at all. Uh, Peter, we're very grateful for your time. We've got two more for you. Um, mm -hmm. Aside from continuing to win games, what does the club need to keep doing to? maintain the momentum that we're generating um, on and off the field? I oh, just, yeah, doing more of the same. I th look, I think <laughs> that the, the biggest thing is you, you, you can't, it's an interesting thing. The football team is the bigger, dri biggest driver of commercial success of a club. A club yeah. can't be strong and sustainable without having a commercial strong commercial foundation. So they go hand in hand. So a couple of those decisions interact, whether it's the facilities and, and, and other things, and we've got out of gaming and uh, what do we use that for, uh, the funds out of that. Um, and I think the hard, the, the biggest challenge that I think comes for the footy club in the future, and I'm only guessing here, is, is what I call noise. Uh, the expectations with the football club next year are going to be massive now that's what's happened this year, absolutely massive. And uh, we've been saying ever since I started, you can't have lineal success in football. By lineal, I mean straight line improvement year after year. We have. <laughs> and uh, I think we're one of only, up to this year, one of only two clubs that have ever done that in the last five or six years. And that, the other one was Adelaide. And uh, they crashed and burned this year. So, um, you know, they, they, they probably have some challenges for other reasons, but just sometimes football, you know, you just have those sort of years and players have those sort of years where it doesn't all go well and you come off a bit and people get a bit frustrated because they, their expectations were so high and uh, their hopes and dreams were so high and then they get all frustrated and annoyed. And that's what, uh, that's the one thing that, um, causes some problems for some developing clubs and Geelong saw it in 2006 and other, other clubs have seen it. Like if the Giants were in Melbourne right now, they'd probably be a, under siege, but they're not. So they're out in Western Sydney, so no one really cares. And, you know, I just think, uh, I just hope supporters realise that uh, this is a really hard competition. What's been achieved so far is, is fantastic, but, you know, we've still got a way to go. Um, I think this team will be successful. Um, you know, whether that's 2020 or 2021 or 22, you know, it doesn't. They're still very young footballers, and uh, you know, 2019. I'm hoping they'll play in a grand final. I'm hoping they'll win it. But if they don't, we're still on the right path, and uh, I think there's a big future for the footy club. So it's really the noise. I think that's uh, the thing I would worry about most. And, and how the club might handle that if, if that sort of scenario did eventuate. Uh, Peter, one final one for you. Uh, we had a listener interested in getting into sports admin. Uh, what's your advice for someone looking to follow that path? <laughs> Gee, that, that's an obscure question. <laughs> I, I get a lot of people asking me that, but I look at them across the other side of the table and see how old they are for starters. <laughs> and so... Um, 
if if they're young and they think they want to do it, I tell them to go out and learn somewhere else in some other industry and come into football a bit later. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, you've got to be in the right time, the right place. You got to you got to know people. You got to you got to get around and you know, that dreaded word called network. Um, you got to get to know people and uh, make sure that uh, they think you're a good fit. And when an opportunity arises, uh, you get considered for it. So, um, so it's a great industry to be in as a, as a legitimate career now. There's no doubt about that. And football and sports administration generally is seen as a as a professional career opportunity. So it's a great opportunity, but getting into it's not easy. And you've got to get into it at the right level, um, which is if you know if you're in a management position at a middle or senior management. So um, get around and try and meet as many people and convince them that you're uh, you're you're a person that can fit into the industry and make a difference. Peter, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all Demon supporters for turning this club around. You raised the club up from the ashes on and off the field. Uh, we're profitable off the field and more competitive on the field. Uh, thank you for giving us your time to talk to us tonight and congratulations and good luck with your retirement. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, hopefully I'll see a lot of people in the grandstand 20, 2019. Absolutely. We'll, we'll be there for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you guys. All right, thanks, thanks Peter. Thanks, Peter.